Courtney Chita, and she works with the Minnesota State Horticulture Society. And I uh, met Courtney in the fall, and she's actually one that provided us our seeds that we sent you after attending our, our monthly Zoom. So we want to thank her for that. And um, she also agreed to talk to us today about seed selection. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, give that ability to Courtney and turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks everybody. And I, the, the, uh, the quick story that I wanted to share about the sweet potato vine um, is that I used to propagate sweet potatoes by actually, um, growing them that way. So I would, I would root sweet potatoes. And then as they would, that whole big vine would grow, I would actually take and cut in between each leaf and then bury the little spot where the leaf attaches to the stem. And then that would grow new roots. And I could grow hundreds of sweet potatoes. <laughs> I think my record was like 400 sweet potatoes from like eight sweet potatoes. <laughs> so just, it's a really fun way to like get really healthy, happy plants to put in the ground outside to grow lots of sweet potatoes from. So um, that's kind of a, a fun trick. Um, so I'm Courtney. I'm from the Minnesota State Horticulture Society, and I'm excited to be with you today to talk about selecting seeds. Um, so we're just going to kind of jump right in and start talking about different kinds of seeds and things to think about when you're looking at seed packets. Um, so what kind of seeds do you want to grow? First, I wanna give you some, some of the terminology and words that you'll often see on seed packets. Um, hybrids are one of the things you'll often see um, if it's a hybrid or if it's this F1 or F2. Um, and usually what this means is that it's a first generation of two distinct parents that are crossed to get that seed type that's in front of you. And these typically um, don't, if you try to save seeds from hybrids, they don't save and they aren't the same as what they would be if you um, if they were not a hybrid. Um, they have to be repurchased every year, and they can sometimes require higher inputs to get them to get uh, really good yields out of them. So they might need more fertilizer um, to grow really well. They're sort of in contrast to open pollinated seeds, and open pollinated seeds are actually really easy to save seeds from. There are seeds that have been handed down from generation to generation. You can save them from year to year. Um, they're to, oftentimes you buy them once and then you can just save seeds you know, every year and not have to rebuy them, which is really nice. And then they can also adapt to your local ecosystem. So um, if you have radish seeds that aren't hybrids, a lot of times if you plant them too early in the springtime, sometimes they'll actually flower and make, uh, make seeds. And those seeds, you can actually save those seeds and replant them that same se season, like later in the summer or later that fall, and they'll actually grow perfectly because they're like they adapt to your your ecosystem really easily and quickly. Um, so that's something to think about as you're um, growing plants and choosing seeds. Another word that's kind of similar to that is heirloom, and heirloom is a tricky word because it typically means that they're open pollinated. Um, so they should pass on the same characteristics to their seeds. And usually they're passed down from generation to generation like open pollinated seeds. But heirloom kind of means that they're, it should mean that they're really old, right? But then like how old are they? Are they like five years old? Are they 20 years old? Are they 100 years old? Are they thousands of years old? And that's kind of up for debate. So um, there's, you know, there are definitely seeds that are thousands of years old and the varieties have been passed down from generation to generation. There's a tomato that I like that's called Zapotec that's like originally from Mexico and it's, you know, thousands of years old. There's other tomatoes like green zebra. And I don't know if any of you guys have grown green zebra tomatoes, but that's like a quintessential heirloom tomato <laughs> that um, people call an heirloom tomato because it's green and it looks weird because it's green and yellow striped and it's really pretty. Um, but it's really from like the 1980s. So is that really old? Is that old enough to be called an heirloom? I don't know. So, and usually a lot of times things that are heirloom, they're, they, people are saving the seeds because they taste better and they're really good tasting. So um, keep that in mind as you are looking at seeds. And then to kind of go into another category of different kinds of seeds, you have untreated seeds, which are just like the raw seed. They've been cleaned and they're ready to plant, but there's really nothing special about them. 
You can also find treated seeds. And these are often like really brightly colored. Um, and they've usually been uh, treated with some kind of pesticide or fungicide to, to make them grow better or to keep pests away from them. Um, but, and they're really, they're usually dyed a certain color so that they look really bright. Um, so if you see seeds like that, you definitely don't wanna eat any of those seeds because they probably have a poison on them. Um, but that's something to keep in mind that you'll sometimes see. And then the third kind of option is um, coated seeds, which sometimes they coat seeds that are really, really tiny to make them easier to plant individually. Um, so these are, this, this shows like the lettuce seeds in the foreground and then the, the coated lettuce seeds. So they're bigger um, and they're circular. So they're easier to plant with machinery um, and they're just easier to individually plant versus um, if they're untreated raw seeds, then they oftentimes are, you know, really, really tiny. And that coating will just dissolve over time. And so it's, it's pretty easy to plant. Um, and then you have organic seeds. Organic seeds are certified organic. They're grown by the USDA standards. Um, they can't be treated. They can't be genetically modified. They can be coated um, if that coating is approved. Um, and they could be hybrid or they could be open pollinated. So kind of like lots of different little nuances of all these different kinds of seeds that you can find. A lot of times the big key thing is you'll see this USDA organic seal. And that's a, a good sign that they're organic. The thing that I like about organic seeds too, even if you're not growing organically, is a lot of times they're sort of meant to be, um, they haven't been grown with a lot of inputs. They haven't been grown with like high, they're, they're kind of like almost the opposite of a hybrid and that they don't necessarily need like a lot of inputs to really succeed well. Um, they're, because they've been grown organically, they hopefully are gonna be more resistant to pests um, in that they are just used to like, growing without a lot of input. So they're gonna grow easily. Um, conventional seeds, you're never gonna, like I've never seen a seed that's actually labeled conventional. <laughs> um, so these are seeds that are not organic. They're kind of just regular seeds. They're usually untreated, they're usually uncoated. They could be treated, they could be coated. Um, they could be open pollinated, they could be hybrid. They're kind of just regular seeds. And then the last kind of big category like that is like a genetically modified en or engineered seed. Um, and these are pretty hard to buy on accident. Like you're not gonna find genetically modified seeds in the you know seed packet in your hardware store. Like you pretty much have to buy them from bulk. You have to like, <laughs> they're, they're, you have to buy like 50 pounds of it at a time usually. Um, so yeah, you're, you're probably not gonna find these very easily. You'd have to do a whole lot of work to find those. Um, and they've usually been treated with like something, they've had like a gene spliced into them so that when, you know, like Roundup um, is sprayed on the field, they won't kill the plant, but it'll kill all the weeds around them. So that's something to keep in mind. So then thinking about kind of what criteria do you want to use to choose varieties? Um, taste and appearance, like I, I love like the rainbow colored everything. Um, I'm all about the like rainbow carrots and the rainbow chard and the crazy looking tomatoes. And I, I like to grow tomatoes of like every size and shape. So from little teeny teeny tiny ones to great big huge ones and all the colors that I can find them in because that's what appeals to me. And I, I think the appearance, I wanna grow things that I wanna grow. Um, I also wanna grow things that taste really good. Um, this last year with my son, we grew um, dragon tongue green beans and they're like a yellow green bean with like little purple flecks. And they're so beautiful and they really taste good. <laughs> We've been missing those this winter a lot. We're like, where are they? Um, but we'll have to wait till next spring when next summer and we can grow some more of those. So taste and appearance are definitely like good qualities that you want to look for and think about. Um, habit is another one. Is it a bush or a pole or a vine? Um, so here's like a bush bean and you can see it says bush bean. So it's going to grow more compact. It's not going to need a big trellis to, to climb on versus this pole bean is going to really need something to climb up. It's going to need a trellis. It's going to need a fence. I planted lots of beans on fences last summer because it's just a really easy way to grow up and not have to grow out. Um, what else can you think about? I think in Minnesota, it's really important to think about days to maturity. Um, this days to maturity is this like 45 days they often see on seed packets. And that doesn't necessarily mean exactly 45 days or exactly 65 days. It's actually a kind of a complicated temperature equation, but it gives you an idea of is, is it gonna be fast or is it gonna be slow? 
Um, if it's 45 days, that's only like a month and a half. That's pretty fast. If it's like 120 days, that's like three months. And you're like, do I have that much time to in our short growing seasons here? So typically you want to look for shorter days than longer days. Um, that's kind of related to time to harvest. Also, I think frost resistance and hardiness are really important to think about too. Like, um, especially if you're planting something really early or if you're planting something kind of later, um, we can get frosts, you know, into May here. They can come as early as sometime in September. So thinking about things that are more frost resistance um, is really important to think about too. Um, also, you can find oftentimes like disease resistant and pest resistant information. A lot of times after the name, they'll have these little letters and that'll tell you about different diseases that are um, resistant to that variety. And so if you've had problems with like late bite, then you want to look for, you know, some of these letters on your seed packet. Or if you've had problems with downy mildew, if you've had problems with um, by different viruses and things like that, that can be a really helpful, useful thing to, to know about. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too. And then also uh, ease of harvest. Unlike melons, I like to look for slipping varieties. And what that means is when you're going to like pick it up and kind of tug on it, when it's ripe, it's just going to fall off the vine. <laughs> and that, that's a really great way because melons are sometimes hard and tricky to know when they're, they're ripe. Um, so sometimes they'll have like clues on the seed packet about like how to harvest it or when it's ready for harvest. And that can be really helpful too. Day length is another one of those kind of goofy things that um, you don't necessarily see. You see it on onions, and it's really all about like the, the onions that will grow best uh, here in Minnesota. So here in Minnesota, we want long day onions. If we were further south, we would want like intermediate day or short day. But in Minnesota, we have long days in the summer. Our, our day length, you know, is over 14 hours from like the end of May till the, the beginning, the end of August. We have like day lengths that are over 14 hours every single day. And so you need to have long days so that you get good onions uh, in Minnesota. So I think, yeah, that's kind of my little quick, quick and dirty uh, explanation of some seed selecting tips. Do you guys have any questions? Courtney.